Om Shanti. Very warm welcome to everyone. Today's, for today's Tuesday's Tuesday talk, Gratitude Boost with Denise Lawrence. Some of you have been joining the series with Sister Denise, who is a Raj Yogi meditator for over 45 years and brings that spiritual knowledge into practical applications and helps us understand how do we apply spiritual principles. She has produced many TV shows on spirituality, psychology, karma, Bhagavad Gita, and many others. How the relevant topics of today's world events uh, could be answered, could be understood through spiritual principles. She is a much sought after speaker internationally, and we have the fortune to have uh, the knowledge transfer from her. Today's topic is gratitude boost. This is the week of Thanksgiving in US. And we all are thinking of so many things we are thankful for being on this land, being with each other, and being in this world. But there are many questions as well. And so Sister Denise will be addressing this topic from spiritual viewpoint. And we will have question answers in the chat. Please keep sending um, the questions. And at the end, at the very end, you will be unmuted and you can give your comments or wave goodbye to Sister Denise. As this session is recorded, we would like to keep everyone's privacy and so this is the arrangement for that. So enjoy the talk. Over to you, Sister Denise. <clears throat> well, thank you very much, uh, Sister Sukanya. And it is um, a very important week, I think, for the world. <laughs> thank you so much, Sister Sukanya. Uh, this is a very important week for the world. Um, in the United States, Thanksgiving has been celebrated on the third, Tuesday, third Thursday of November since um, <clears throat> about 1863, something like this. It was initiated by Abraham Lincoln to... Uh, think about our relationship as a community in this world who has benefited a great deal from the fruits of the earth and the uh, generosity of the First Nations people who took care of the settlers at the onset of winter, which was something completely um, unanticipated by the people who came from Europe to the, settle in the United States and uh, they were taught how to get through the winter in terms of food and warmth and keeping the self in a good condition. And uh, there has been, this is a very wealthy land full of beauty and natural resources. And so the people who live here are very grateful to have this chance to live in such a, um, an, a land of abundance and opportunity. And Abraham Lincoln was very aware that um, during this process of settling here, this world of many peoples and many cultures and many languages, and many religions, um, there are also distressing 
elements of this culture and community. And so along with the gratitude for what we have here, there was also a, um, a feeling that uh, in the process, people have made many mistakes and done many things which are against the laws of spirituality, which are against what it means to be human. And of course, the consequences of that are experienced in terms of human suffering, of um, humanity's inhumanity to itself and to nature. So that while nature is generous, uh, what we also have created is um, a lot of the dangers associated with climate change. And to what extent are people responsible for this? And to what extent it was going to happen anyway, nobody can really say. <clears throat> but there is something that has been in my mind, um, which is mentioned in the Bhagavad Gita, and which is also very much part of the traditions of America, and that is the idea of providence. And in the Gita, it says, whatever is predestined is what is happening. And so I think that we need to think about our relationship with um, negative things or what we feel to be negative things in the light of this concept of providence or uh, predestination. And one of the things that Americans like to feel is in control, in control of circumstances, in control of the situation. This idea of being in control is very important because it's part of what it means to be the rugged individual. But I think this has to be mitigated uh, with this concept of providence, that whatever is destined, that is what is happening. And I'm giving importance to this idea at this time, because what we're seeing around us throughout the United States and in the whole world, but especially we are very conscious of what's happening in the US because we're here. And that is that uh, there's a lot of um, um, unsorted, unresolved uh, karmic accounts, unresolved issues between and among different groups, different communities. There has been a lot of violence and uh, how this violence is handled is also a contentious point and how it came up in the first place is a very contentious point. But what we also have to see in the world all around us is no matter where you look, there is a lot of polarization between people and communities, and there's a lot of violence going on. In every home, someone is suffering. Um, one of the things that we have been facing for the last year and a half is the COVID-19 restrictions and so on. And while in Europe, there is a big severe wave uh, another wave of COVID, a, a Delta wave. Uh, yet in the, the US at the moment, things are beginning to open up and people are able to meet and see each other and uh, gather together in community after a long uh, break of just seeing one another on screen. 
talking to one another through video and just dealing with how you feel when a lot of freedoms are suddenly removed because of some larger threat which is uh, affecting everyone. And one of the things that it has uh, created is a sense of community in the sense that people are taking care of each other. It's a very important thing. And I think that when we're thinking about thanksgiving and gratitude, uh, the, the feelings that are going on between and among people to help each other in difficult times is quite um, important and something that we can be very grateful for. One of the things that the uh, COVID-19 did is it kept people more at home because you couldn't go out to so many places. You still can't go out to a lot of places. You uh, have the issues of vaccinated or non-vaccinated and the restrictions that go along with that. But because more people are spending more time at home, it's given a lot of attention to family. And people are feeling the uh, importance and value of eating at home together. You can't eat out in restaurants so easily nowadays. So eating at home together, uh, being together, doing things together. Uh, you can't go on holiday in the same way as we used to. So people are uh, going to the national forests and um, into the countryside uh, together. And it's like uh, uh, something that was sort of lost and forgotten has come back. And uh, I think that is a very important thing to be grateful for because people, while we give importance to the rugged individual, but people really don't do well in isolation. And it is very natural for people to come together in families, could be biologic, biological families, or it could be a gathering together because you share the same faith or the same interests or sport or something like this. But all of these things um, make you realize the importance of the company of others and valuing not so much the physical things, this is definitely the world of materialism, uh, but having attained everything that money can buy, what is left? And that has to do with something much more subtle, much more, um, much deeper, and that is um, the human being not the human body, which has been made into a commodity, but the human heart, the human spirit, the human being. Uh, people are talking about the importance of caring in a way that they hadn't been in earlier times when it was all about getting. And um, people are also feeling in the issues that still exist between different communities where some are in position of power, some are uh, in a position of being disempowered, the kind of internal uh, feeling of hurt, which used to be just um, completely muzzled, it's beginning to be expressed. This is something that we've seen in the last couple of years that all those people who had to keep silent, um, the girls who were trafficked, the children who were abused, the uh, native peoples who were abused, and, and because of the 
a social setup, it um, caused everybody who was hurt to have to keep quiet. Uh, but now the voices are beginning to be heard, uh, which is, I think, opening up a feeling of um, the importance of caring for the human person, uh, which is completely independent of external physical considerations. When you are looking at everything in terms of matter and material and commodities, you look at people as things, you know, but um, a person is not a thing. A body, no doubt, is a thing. It is material. You can um, analyze it entirely in terms of the material aspects, but nobody really knows what life is. And in the last little while, the importance of life and quality of life has been coming up and uh, aspects of human suffering that were considered not real or not valid or not important are clearly very important and it also means that we are um, circumstantially finding ourselves challenging cultural values which made people into things. And this new feeling that's coming up more and more, partly in response to the issues of climate change, partly in response to the issues of race relations, community relations at all levels, um, because we have seen human beings treating each other inappropriately uh, because they feel justified in doing it because it's culturally acceptable and it is considered a value. And all this is being challenged. And I think this is a very important thing to be very thankful for, uh, because this has returned us in a very important way to our humanity and made us look at each other in the eyes, in the soul, and see who is there behind this body who is the being behind the face? Up until now, we've just been looking at the skin, but behind the skin is the being. Or we've been looking at gender, behind the gender is a being. Um, we're looking at relationships. Because of the um, culture of making people into things, it has caused I think it's gone a long way to cause a serious deterioration in human relationships. And this isolation was compounded by the enforced isolation that many people experienced in the COVID lockdowns because people were alone and nobody cared and nobody noticed if you're alive or dead this kind of thing. And I think that, um, well, on the one hand, people talk about how bad all of this is because so many people have died, so many people have suffered. And sometimes, in fact, not just sometimes, but very often, it takes a level of human suffering to be a wake-up call for us, to wake up to the importance of um, the human being, the human person, uh, who is essentially a spiritual being who manifests through the body, definitely, but our culture had looked only at the material things, and it, it went to a point where it can't go any further because 
things broke down. And now I think this return to the self to wonder, well, who am I? What am I? What is this all about? What is life? I think in earlier times, people would um, look at different religions and spiritual movements for answers. And I think that there was a lot of betrayal, a lot of disappointment, and um, there was, I think, a, a very deep failure on the part of the uh, conventional and the new religious movements um, wasn't really able to satisfy mm -hmm. this. It's much more than a curiosity, but a need to know what this is all about. And if you listen to what people are talking about these days, they're talking about uh, a kind of spirituality which is above and beyond the faith traditions, above and beyond some of the new religious movements, above and beyond um, what's already partly the cause of the polarization and the antagonism between peoples. But um, I think people are catching on to the common ground that we have between and among ourselves, uh, which is behind the cultures and traditions and faiths and all of that. And that to me is really important and something to be immensely thankful for because it creates um, the ability to see one another as who we really are, to see um, behind all of those ways in which people discriminate against each other and prevents anyone from discerning or discriminating in the real sense of the word to discriminate who is the person in front of you. Can you see that person? Can you see their heart? Can you see their soul? Can you appreciate who they are, what they've been through, how their life experience has created wounds and scars, and has it awakened your feelings of compassion and um, sensitivity to really find that humanity that is so important um, and which is the stuff of which life is made. That's why life is sacred. Um, people say life is sacred, but they don't really know why. They don't really know what is life. We, we know about things. We know about physical achievements, but um, you know, the value of something very subtle and simple as love. You know, people think of love as um, you know, conquering a loved one and making that person belong to you. This is not love. This is taking possession of a human being and bringing them under your power and calling that love. But that's not really love because it leads to suffering. And uh, so I think maybe we can be very thankful that we now have many ways to interact in such a way that it's no longer a give and take of suffering. Um, <clears throat> Going back to this idea of whatever is predestined is what is taking place, I think that this is also predestined. Uh, destiny or proven, providence is uh, a mysterious concept, but most people do subscribe to it, even if they don't really know it. It's a feeling, it's an intuition. 
And in the Bhagavad Gita, it says very clearly, whatever is predestined, that is what is happening. And it also um, has to be that way so that our relationship with things that appear to be bad or appear to be good has to be revisited. We look at something, we say it's bad, but according to whom? According to what perspective? If you look at it as everything is destined, and then you ask yourself, well, if everything is destined, is destiny a good thing or not a good thing? And from the angle of spiritual philosophy, we would have to say that if something is destined, something is the creation of the creator, then it may look bad, but out of that dark cloud, there is a silver lining. Out of the conflict, there is um, a beautiful phoenix that rises out of the ashes of these conflagrations and that is also destined and so we need to really take a different or a look at life differently that we are i think called upon to see whatever we encounter in terms of what is this teaching me about me we don't normally look at it like that. We normally think, you know, what is this teaching me about you? <laughs> but it may be, but more than anything, I think what we need to learn is about ourselves. We are individuals, we are different, but we don't understand ourselves very well. And when we don't understand ourselves very well, then the universe, God, the higher power, will put us in circumstances which are lessons because life is a university, I'm convinced of it. And everything that happens, whether it's good or bad or what, contains very important lessons for me, maybe for others as well, but principally it is for me because I'm here to become the very best me that I am. So all these things which are happening are special gifts for the self, uh, whoever we are, and whether the things are pleasant or unpleasant, but they have meaning. And it's very important for us. I think we we're talking this evening about boosting gratitude. And to me, boosting gratitude is about looking deeper into what we uh, are gaining, um, because we are to be grateful for what we are gaining. Um, sometimes the difficulties of life enrich us much more than the apparent successes. So I wanted to just... Um, flag up this maybe a little bit different angle on, on gratitude. And maybe we can just have a few moments of uh, silent reflection to look at the significant events of our lives and how they have shaped us. Even events that are quite negative, how they have brought us wisdom, understanding, compassion, more clarity. Sometimes something good is painful. Other times something pleasant betrays us. And so we can't really think of things that pleasant and unpleasant is the same as good and bad. Looking at the self deeply, 
the spirit within. Feel that inner silence of your own soul, your own self. To the huge spectrum of feelings and emotions. And our perspective on everything that's going on around us. Ask the question, how is this teaching me in important ways about me, about who I am, what I am? How do I look in my own inner eye? Feel the self with love and depth of understanding. And then you can see others in a better light and appreciate who is around you, what is happening around you. And consider all of these as gifts from the higher source, all for the purpose of becoming the very best me that I can be. Thank you. So let's see if um, Sukanya Ben will moderate for us your questions and comments, or if you have your own. <laughs> Thank you, Sister Denise. That was a very wonderful angle or rather many angles that you took on this subject, looking at it from the world view, bird's eye view, cultural point of view, person to person, how do we relate to each other when we look at each other? How do we identify others? How do I identify myself? Wow, that is a very profound angle on gratitude. <laughs> so I would um, encourage you to write your questions in the chat, comments in the chat. Meanwhile, uh, this is also being live streamed, so I will check. Yeah, there are no questions as such. Yeah, I think the um, one of the reasons there is uh, there are no questions because you gave us so such depth <laughs> of thinking that uh, I think everyone is really thinking about gratitude, which we often think very superficially. I am grateful for you know the things around me. I am grateful for this body, this working body, working mind, and so on. But yes, every situation that has happened with me has happened for bringing something good out of me. And it has helped me to understand the other person, which is a great learning as well. So that's good. 
this being a Thanksgiving week, especially families get together. And many times, year after year, no matter how much gratefulness practice we do towards our family and towards everything, still something sparks up in the conversation. And that makes us heavy and we look for, you know, we look for Sunday to come and how we um, just go back to our destination. If, if in case we are traveling, we are with the family. So we are just looking for our flight to be, you know, our flight departure time. So can you give us some insights? What happens in that moment? How can we best handle it? It's an interesting thing that the holidays, which are supposed to be very wonderful and marvelous and, um, and bring us close because family is very important, but yet uh, this is the time, especially when there is greatest amount of strife and stress within families. And there's a number of reasons for this. And it's, it's not that the holiday does it to us, but it's the fact that we are not distracted by work and other kinds of busyness. And we are thrown together uh, with people with whom we are connected because of karmic accounts. And when we're busy or separated or whatever, then we don't really deal with the things that there are that um, are problems between us. And this is why I um, appreciate actually all the study of spirituality and practice and so on that I've been able to do because I mean, every time I come together with, whether it's my biological family or um, different configurations of my gigantic spiritual family, naturally among people where there is closeness, there's all sorts of um, issues because um, you know, we don't all have exactly the same values. We assume everybody has the same values as us, but we don't check it. And if we did, we'd be quite surprised because a lot of people assume that, well, values are universal. Everybody has the same values and so should be just fine. But values has to do with your priorities and people have different priorities. And the other thing, that gets in the way is assumptions and expectations. And uh, we find it difficult to allow a person to be who they are, whether it's good, bad, or indifferent. And I think it's part of our cultural heritage to try to correct each other. And nobody really likes being corrected and they definitely will not go along with it, but it, it does create strife. And so it's very important to just um, allow each other to be who we are and um, allow each other to do things in the way, you know, there's many different ways to sit together for food. There's many different ways to communicate with each other. There's many different ways to enable difficult situations to become smooth by, um, by opening up space, you know, between people and by uh, looking at the the essence of a person because every everyone has 
an essence. And when you see the essence of a person, you see what it is you love about that person. And when you look at people through the lens of expectations and assumptions and things, the games that people play with each other, um, you know, you, you are going to open up some conflict and you are going to get hit if you play like that and then things go wrong. What people don't have enough of is what I call spiritual power, which is a kind of resilience. And spiritual power happens slowly in a person or is accumulated slowly in a person uh, when they uh, meditate, when they think about these things regularly and deeply. And um, you may find yourself shifting your priorities also. Um, if somebody digs at you, insults you, um, says something about you that you feel ashamed of or exposes you in some way, if you don't have spiritual power, you will have a very, very strong reaction to something like that. But if you do have spiritual power, you know who you are. You are in your power. And when somebody wants to provoke you, you're very conscious that you have the option to be provoked or not be provoked. You don't have to go there. Um, but when people don't have spiritual power, they don't, don't really have the possibility to exercise their right to, you know, experience it in another way. It comes at you, hits you, <laughs> presses your buttons, and, and that's the end of that. So I'm actually very uh, thankful that um, my life circumstances and my inner curiosity and so on really made me give a big priority to the spiritual side of things. And, uh, you know, there are very good reasons. You may have very good reasons according to the prevailing social attitudes and values and so on, that if somebody treats you a certain way, you want to take revenge, you want to take them down. But when you're in your power, um, you just don't. I remember someone was saying to me, oh, you don't fight. I said, no, I don't fight. Um, doesn't mean I'm not strong. But, you know, I don't need to fight. Because it's not that important. <laughs> If it is important, I will not lose. <laughs> you know? um, but I'm not going to you know, devalue or cheapen my capacity to stand up for myself or for what I uh, consider as right uh, when really pushed. But most of the time, people push about things that are actually pretty trivial. And, um, you know, when you uh, practice spirituality, you get a lot of flexibility. And, and things that maybe matter to some people, they're very important, you will say, no, that doesn't matter. Respects you, don't respect you. I respect myself. So if you don't respect me, it doesn't make any difference because I respect myself. If you don't respect yourself, you need other people to respect you. And if they don't, that's really a big trouble. But if you respect yourself, then um, you're not really dependent on whether other people do or not. Or if you get sidelined, 
you know your value doesn't matter you're sidelined or not sidelined because you know your value but so many of us we depend on the feedback of others in order to feel good about ourselves and in that way we give away our power and that's not a good idea so yeah a few thoughts on that thank you in very good a very rounded way of thinking of looking at everything on that line uh, there is a question uh, you answered it kind of but um so question is do you have any suggestions for letting go of lingering threads of resentment towards a person from the past who lets us down in in a certain respect i have let go of it a lot but still find resentment that creeps in on occasions thank you i think that it is um connected with this idea of expectation you expect a person to be at a certain level and operate at a certain level and you want to hold them to that and then if they don't then um, you do resent it um, maybe that person says you know i am so and so and you say okay you're so and so and the implication is you have to be such and such and such and such and if you're not then i'm let down i'm disappointed i'm betrayed and um so it's possible i think to go beyond that and really see that look all these people however much they may occupy positions of seniority or they may be positioning themselves as very significant relationships but you know they're only human all of them are only human and all of them are spiritually depleted every single last one you know i think we get so uh, caught up in a person's assumed identity and we don't like it when they do not come up to expectations you know someone may be a, a professor in your college and you expect that professor to teach you well but how many good teachers are there not that many how many people have the job as teachers many and if you are fortunate to get a good teacher um that is one in a million and i think the same applies for parents how many people have ideal parents i haven't come across any so far you know because everybody does not come up to expectation we create these ideals okay a perfect mother a perfect father then becomes a mother a father should be ought to be must be isn't and it's just so good i think that's also why i i took up this idea of predestination it's so good to understand that whoever you got that's who you got and um they're unlikely to be ideal highly unlikely uh, everybody has plenty of shortcomings but we kind of put on people these very strong expectations sometimes you say okay well, you know i'm i'm in this college i paid a lot of money for this course and i'm not getting my money's worth cuz the teachers are not good enough for me and um then you can resent i mean i i'm 
not, not sure if I'm talking about the kind of resentment that you may be um, experiencing, but you know, in, in any close relationships, it's always a give and take. And if you go with the idea that everyone is spiritually depleted, whatever you want from someone, they will not be able to give it any more than you will be able to give them what they want from you. And But we're not realistic about these things. And what I've learned in my spiritual um, studies and practice is that uh, there is a higher being, a higher power, who will not disappoint you, but who will definitely hold you accountable for your own way of handling yourself and your own way of handling your circumstances. And this um, mystery, this phenomenon of being held accountable for one's own behavior through one's relationship with a higher being is it's really very interesting because it causes you to be just face to face with yourself and um, become very aware what you are doing that is not really who you, who your essence is that there's a an essential self a real self which is like really beautiful, really good. And then we deviate from that for one reason or another. And being held accountable in this way for oneself by your relationship with the Supreme Being um, is a very, very good way to get oneself back to the essential self because <laughs> you don't have anyone else to blame. There is no one. So that's also something to be grateful for, actually. Yeah, this is a holiday season and uh, so there is also a gift exchange. So one example, um, this is from one of the participants, one example, on one of the past Christmas, my brother threw out all the gifts he had planned to give us. He no longer speaks to us. Gifts are a trouble, especially for those who have less money. <laughs> uh, that reminds us of that very well-known story of the couple who loved each other dearly and wanted to give each other a gift. And um, they sacrificed the most valuable thing they had for the other person, who in turn sacrificed the most valuable thing they had for the other person. And um, it's, it's the story. Uh, you know, with gifts, um, we think of the value of gifts in terms of how much money they cost. I see. And, you know, now with the COVID times, there are many shops are shut and there's a lot of shortages. And one of the things that people are starting to do is make stuff, make stuff for each other. And, um, you know, a gift is, is a token. It's uh, something that represents um, like a, a souvenir, a memory. Remember me with this. Um, people give flowers, which are there long enough to be photographed and <laughs> they wilt, or they give sweets or something like this, it doesn't mean that a gift has to be something that has to have a certain monetary value in order to be valuable. But I think the greatest gift is the gift of love. And when you 
create something, draw a picture, um, something like this. I, um, uh, a very good friend of mine had a birthday today and I thought, ah, oh, you know, I'm going to just gather together my photographs and put some songs on these photographs, which kind of express my feeling of my value for my friendship with this person. And it, and I could do it because I have that capacity. And, um, and it went a very long way, but it didn't cost me anything, nothing. But yet the person really felt good. And I think that um, this is what these days are telling us. Let's, let's get away from only dealing with the material value of things. We have so many things. Everybody complains of having too much stuff. Uh, but there's so much that we can do with that stuff to turn it from one thing into another thing, take the things that we don't use and make them into something that we will use, take something we don't like and change it, make it into something we do like. Um, and and uh, just bringing in that, that creativity and that love is uh, actually goes a long way because people feel the totality of you when you give them something from you, which is not the same as going out and buying something that you think they will like, or maybe you're afraid that they think it's too cheap or too this or too that. It makes people crazy, but uh, um, I think it's also because of that sort of commercial thing that keeps bombarding us that you're nothing if you don't give something of a certain value because it's all about um, making the money go around. You know, where, where I was living recently in, in Germany, they have a very, very big spike of COVID. So everything is shut, the Christmas markets are closed, so people can't meet. And uh, see. <laughs> You have to sit at home and create little biscuits for each other or a little something and um, and spend time together. I think the greatest gift is your, your love and attention to someone. And we've kind of forgotten how to do that because everyone's on their device, right? You have all these pictures of everybody in a room <laughs> looking at their cell phone or their tablet or something and it has um, sort of destroyed this um, milk of human kindness that uh, makes the world go round. So I think it's very significant that you're experiencing this and that your brother got so frustrated with the whole thing he just threw it all away. It's totally understandable. And uh, it's a call to us to really rethink everything. And uh, it's okay. <laughs> Thank you. Another question is, how to differentiate between setting expectations with your child versus setting limits that they need to abide by? How to know? whether you are crossing the link into expecting them to behave a certain way while convincing yourself that these are limits you as a parent need to teach them. Well, this is every parent has this question, right? And uh, what is important is to understand that a child needs love and structure. A child needs you to be consistent and you are the king of the castle, so you set the rules, but then you have to abide by them also. Because if you uh, have one rule for them and another rule for you, then the child is going to come along and say, hey, what is this? 
And I think it's also very important, of course, this depends on the age of the child and, and so many um, individual characteristics. You have to really understand that this child, if you know, if you subscribe to the idea of reincarnation, which I do, this child was formerly older than you. <laughs> and this is a person. And you don't know who this person is because you just see a child, which is an object. And I think it's really very important when you're relating with children to listen to them, listen to their heart. And um, they will push your boundaries because they need to know what the limits are. And they need to know that those limits are consistent because if you change the limits all the time it'll make them crazy and it'll make them very reactive and rebellious so they need consistency they need love they need company be with your child talk with your child not at your child listen and uh, spend time because that's the most important thing that's what every child want is uh to be in contact with the parents, to feel the protection, the consistency, the love, the systems, whatever the systems are, they, they will work with them as long as they're consistent. What makes a child nuts, which makes anybody nuts, is inconsistency. And, uh, you know, Children are very sensitive, very intelligent, and very logical. And so there's nothing wrong with um, negotiating the rules, but you have to stick to what you say they are. And if there are consequences for breaking the rules, they have to be realistic, they have to be suitable, and they have to be consistent. And inconsistency is the greatest problem in um, parent-children relationships. Inconsistency and also neglect. If, you, if you're going to have a child, it's a 20, 30, 40-year commitment. <laughs> and you need to be aware of that. It's a relationship. <laughs> 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 